Well, here we are again on Healthcare Unfiltered. Um, it's going to be a fun episode because I, I'm in a, the company of two Canadians. Uh, I'm not really sure how this will go, but um, uh, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, I, you know, before we went on the record, uh, uh, one of my guests, Michael, was telling me about hockey, and my knowledge of hockey is uh, uh, below zero. Um, but, but we are going to talk about an important topic today. Um, quality of life, patient report outcomes, clinical trials, all of the good stuff that you like to hear to hear uh, about. So we start by introducing our guests. Uh, you know, Chris Booth, we can wait on him because he's been on the show a couple of times. Uh, Michael, um, maybe a little bit about you and who you are, where you work and and uh, what do you do what do you do day in and uh, day out? Yeah, thanks. It's uh, great to be here. Um, so I'm a clinician scientist, which uh, means I do clinical work. I am care for cancer patients as a radiation oncologist. That's my gig. And that keeps me pretty busy. Uh, but I also have a scientific program in health services research broadly. So that's the quality of care um, issues. And one of those is about measuring PROs and clinical trials and taking advantage of the patient voice, as we call it, when we conduct trials, so we can get the patient's perspective on how the two or more arms of the trial have have affected them, has affected their health, and how they value the the other endpoints of the clinical trial. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's a great career because I get to interact with patients and diagnose what's wrong with them, and I get to interact with the healthcare system and diagnose what's wrong with it, and see if we can make it better. What got you interested in the quality of life thing? Is it part of observations, radiation oncology, or just? Uh... Yeah, well, so I'm old. <laughs> uh, I came to Queens as a fellow a long time ago, it seems like now, almost 40 years. And um, I got involved with a guy called Joe Pater, who ran the clinical trials group at the time. And he was interested in this new thing at the time called quality of life, actually getting patients to tell us how they how they feel when they're on a clinical trial. And I've stuck with it. I did my master's with Dr. Pater and he supervised me and we um, showed that um, patients are much more reliable, for instance, than, than nurses are. It's, it's, it's more effective to ask a patient how they feel than to ask the nurse to try to measure how the patient feels and record it on a separate scale. So that was the first thing we did that kind of launched my thinking about how important it is to get data directly from the patient in terms of how they're feeling on a clinical trial. And then use that information clinically to help inform oncologists to make better decisions about which which treatment is the best treatment. Mike, can I, uh, I ask Chris, a question? Well, before you ask, hold, hold on. Okay, go ahead. Before, go you ahead. Answer, before you <laughs> ask questions, you get, who are you? You can introduce yourself. All right. Okay, Chris Booth, the other Canadian on the show tonight. Um, uh, it's a privilege to be back. Uh, I wear my healthcare filtered uh, T-shirt with pride. The second one, because the first one, of course, was I stolen. I need to send one to Michael now. Yeah, Brundage, he's also a runner, so he needs one. These are very nice T-shirts, Mike, but every time they come across the border, they get stolen. And so we have to get the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on that case. Uh, they so clearly I'm are valuable. I run a health services research program. I work very closely with Michael in the same unit. Uh, professor of Oncology and Public Health here at Queen's. Um, but I just want to jump in because Mike's story and his niche academically is very unique. Um, and I've heard bits and pieces of this kind of history of Brundage over time. But Mike, tell the listeners and remind me and tell Chadi, how did you come to inhabit this space in both like as a hardcore member of the clinical trials community, but also a card carrying health services researcher, because most of us do kind of one or the other. Maybe we dabble a little bit in, in one and, and focus on the other, but you're really very engaged in both. To tell us about that. How did that happen and, and where did that come from? Um, my dog just came in to say hello. <laughs> just, uh, we'll just pause the things for a minute. No, it's we. It's unfiltered. Now the listeners can know that you have a dog, and the dog came in, which is <laughs> my, my dog. My dog just heard me talking behind the door and decided that he really wanted to come and meet you too. And yeah, now that's... he's going to go back. Now he's going. He's a puppy. He's only he's only six months old. So he's and he's a hundred pounds already. So he's a he's a piece of work. But anyway, thanks, Chris, for the question. So 
Yeah, I, I, I was lucky enough to get into clinical trials when clinical trials were just developing um, their um, methodology in terms of measuring PROs properly. At the time, we called it quality of life. PRO is a newer term that in, embraces and includes quality of life, but it includes other patient-reported outcomes as well. <clears throat> but I, I, um, I worked with a guy called McKillop, who you may have mentioned previously, who was interested in health services research. And so on the clinical trial side, I was interested in how to conduct clinical trials and measure quality of life outcomes effectively and to communicate those back to clinicians so that they could use them in terms of counseling future patients. Uh, but also, McKillop was interested in uh, improving the healthcare system. And that included uh, a, a domain that we called uh, patient level decision making. So, helping uh, physicians and patients make better decisions together, shared decision making, some people call it. But we, we were curious about how to improve um, clinical trials, how to improve the healthcare system, and as a piece of that, how to improve doctor patient decision making as part of the healthcare system. And all that kind of gelled into a, a common thread between conducting pro trials properly and using the information that the trial generated effectively. Um, and so that kind of kept the two alive. And I still, I still enjoy doing research in both both areas. So let, let let's start. Um, you know, I I want to I want to do this I, I, as I'm thinking through this. So Chris, if you're designing a clinical trial, a therapeutic clinical trial in medical oncology today, we're taping this in 2023. Is assessing quality of life a must end point in any type of an interventional clinical trial? I mean, are you, or is it selective? In other words, what type of a clinical trial that you are conducting and running, you would add quality of life as part of the endpoints that you're measuring and which trials you won't? And then I'm going to actually pivot to Michael and ask him, how would we measure these in the trials that you are asking to do this? But but uh, tell me. Yeah, great question. I mean, so I can pontificate hypothetically, and then Mike has to tell us, you know, how we would actually do this in practice, kind of, you know, when the rubber meets the road. So I think the default here is we should always measure quality of life. But what do patients care about? They want to live well, and they want to live longer lives. So when we're testing a new intervention, ideally, we should be measuring both survival and quality of life. So I, I would say that's the starting point, but from a very pragmatic point of view, I would say certainly in the advanced setting, when we're delivering palliative intent therapies, when life is short and the potential gains in survival are modest, then it behooves us in that very short time frame to understand the impact on the patient's quality of life with the interventions that we're delivering. So I, I think in that setting, in fact, I think I think we're really failing our patients as a community if we're running a phase three um, RCT in the palliative space and not measuring quality of life. Um, and in the adjuvant setting, I would also, you know, propose that, you know, we're, we're exposing patients to some pretty toxic and difficult therapies, and we want to know long-term how they feel and what the long-term side effects are, and if that has a major detriment to quality of life, because I would imagine if I were a patient and having had, you know, discussions with, you know, hundreds and thousands of patients now, they're going to want to know what the benefit is for their longevity and their cure rate, but they're also going to want to know what life looks like. So I think the starting point is we should do it very broadly, um, for sure in the advanced setting. And I would also argue uh, in most uh, contexts in the adjuvant setting. So Michael, fill us in now. What, what, what's, what's the pragmatic <laughs> approach to this? Well, I, you know, I totally agree with you, Chris. Uh, the The Canadian Clinical Trials Group has a has a policy that, um, at least in phase three trials, which are randomized trials between two different treatment options, as opposed to early phase trials, in those definitive trials where it's treatment A versus treatment B to see which one is better, we have a policy to always include PROs in those trials unless there's a clear reason why that's not a good idea. But the def and very few ever ever meet that criterion, we, we virtually always have a quality of life endpoint in our phase three clinical trials for exactly the reason that Chris has mentioned. In terms of how we do it, Michael, uh, I, Michael yeah, before you yeah. talk about how you do it, you, you mentioned yeah. PROs. Is yeah. it fair to say that these were not called PROs until recently? So That's take me correct. through 
um, as you describe how you would measure it, uh, mm -hmm. maybe how were you measuring it 20 years ago uh, uh, since you're older than Chris? <laughs> uh, yes, I but, am. But, but, but uh, in all fairness, I mean, when I was in training, it wasn't even called PROs. This was, mm -hmm. I first heard about this term, I would say about eight years ago or so. So yeah, there's lots of different questions wrapped up in that question, but uh, let's let's break it down a little bit. So the term PRO actually really came from the FDA, or at least the FDA popularized it. And they did that to really give us a taxonomy or a classification system for thinking about outcomes. So they used PROs to define anything that came directly from the patient without any kind of filtering. So for instance, my wife can't tell you what my quality of life is that I have to tell you if it's going to be a PR. Um, and likewise, my doctor can't tell you how my quality of life is. My nurse can't tell you, I have to tell you. And that gets at the very subjective definition of what quality of life is. It's something that only I can tell you about, just like you can only tell me how tired you are or how happy you are or how you're feeling today, yet nobody can measure that. You have to tell me. So that's the key to a PRO, it comes directly from the patient. And that distinguish it, distinguishes it from cl clinician rated outcomes for you know, the usual toxicity measurements that go into a clinical trial. How much diarrhea is there? How much uh, cough does this treatment cause? Those are clinician reported outcomes as opposed to patient reported outcomes. And then you have um, uh, other ob uh, um, observed outcomes, like say a treadmill test, that the uh, you know booth would fail miserably. But the, those objective measures of outcome, we we um, we also classify. So that the FDA gave us this way of thinking about different types of outcomes and how we can use them all in clinical trials. <clears throat> and so the patient reported outcomes includes quality of life. It also includes some other things like say satisfaction with care or anything you might ask the patient directly. Um, but quality of life is is the subset of PROs that deal with um, aspects about quality of life. So symptom well-being, functional well-being, you know, how well do you function physically? How well are you functioning socially? What's your emotional functioning like? What are your what are your what, what are your finances? How do they affect your health? All those things that go beyond symptoms, yes, but all those things that go beyond symptoms. And we call those dimensions or functional scales. Uh, and those comprise quality of life. Uh, we've been measuring those things for a long, long time. Um, uh, the pioneers like Aronson and, and um, Scylla developed instruments that would measure these different things. They'd measure symptoms and they'd also ask a bunch of questions to say, let, let's, let's, try, uh, let's try to measure your physical well-being. You know, how well are you doing physically? And the original questions were things like, can you walk a flight of stairs? Can you carry a bag of groceries? Things that would divide people from fairly good functioning physically to, you know, not so good functioning physically. Now we have much more sophisticated ways of doing that as an industry, but the principle is the same. You, you ask a bunch of questions and each of those questions is designed to measure ultimately how well uh, the patient is doing on, on some sort of metric, say, tiredness or um, emotional well-being or what, what, whatever you whatever domain you that the instrument is designed to, to capture so it's very broad uh, I guess the third point is that it is a science uh, it's important to remember it is, it's a science it's not loosey-goosey it's not think of a few questions write them down and see what the patient says write it up publish it um, it has to be done properly. So the instruments have to be validated. They have to measure what they're intended to measure reliably. Uh, the analysis has to be done properly. And to get back full circle to where we started, um, I, if we're going to do this in all clinical trials, each trial needs a hypothesis about the quality of life outcome. That's part of the scientific process. You got to you got to hypothesize what you're going to find, and then you got to do the right statistical analysis to test that hypothesis. In the same way that you do for survival you know my hypothesis is this new drug is going to improve survival by x amount let's design the trial with sufficient power to show that yes or no let's design the trial to also show the impacts of quality of life according to what we anticipate not just something at random that we pull off the bookshelf um so 
One more set of thoughts, and then I'll, I'll let you kind of explore those things. Uh, we just published a paper, a paper recently in JNCI that, that spelled out the three key ways that this can inform clinical trials. Uh, so one of the key ways is that the PRO is the primary trial endpoint. The trial may be designed, say, um, a, a trial to improve pain in, in the palliative population. The endpoint is pain improvement. You have to use a PRO to measure that. It, it, the PRO has to be the primary endpoint of that study. Um, so PROs are increasingly used as a primary study endpoint, which I think is fantastic. The can second way is to balance. You, can you comment yeah. on the last point, uh, the primary yeah. endpoint PROs? What type of trial is that? So it's so we 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 cited three different examples in that in that paper. Uh, one was a trial looking at pain as an outcome. So, does treatment A or treatment B improve pain better? Um, uh, a second trial was in the palliative care setting. Does does palliative care improve quality of life? Um, and specifically, does early palliative care improve quality of life? Turns out it does. It also improves survival, uh, which was uh, not the primary endpoint, but it was the one that made all the, the news, of course. This is the Temel paper, of course, that randomized patients to early palliative care versus standard uh, of care. And it that early palliative care improved quality of life and also allowed patients to live longer. So those are the types of trials where a PRO is the primary hypothesis that the trial is based on. Um, so the se the second group, so primary outcome is one. The second class of outcomes is where you're trying to describe the harms of treatment so that you can balance those against the benefit. So let's say I've got a new surgical technique. I want to. I, I think it's going to cure more patients, or reduce positive margins, or do something good from a surgical perspective. I'm going to use the quality of life to see okay what harm might come out of that. Procedure, so I want to balance the benefits of the of the intervention against against the risks or the harms from the patient's perspective. And the and the third class is when it actually tips the balance. So there's a few trials that we've done in the Canadian setting, international setting, really, looking at two different strategies to treat um, a problem. Uh, one of the examples is uh, men with prostate cancer with recurrent prostate cancer. Two different ways of of treating those men. Turns out that both work really well. There's no difference in terms of the trial outcome, the primary outcome, which is death from prostate cancer. Uh, but one had a much better quality of life than the other. So it, it, basically the, the quality of life aspects of the trial tipped the balance between which was the better um, choice of treatment. So same primary outcome, but better better secondary outcome, better quality of life. So that, that's how we tend to think of the problem. Primary outcome, balancing, or a key secondary outcome. So, Chris, uh, maybe you can react to this. Uh, what what uh, Mike just said, but it, it's it seems to be that you really want to measure, obviously, quality of life or patients reported outcomes, because even when you're whatever you're going to do, you want to balance the risk versus benefit, and part of the risk calculation is the impact on patients in terms of uh, adverse events and, and all of this but 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 in my mind it has to be apples to apples right so um, are there different scales or different uh, measurements that you would uh, uh, do based on the disease based on the um, uh, uh, age group of the patients that you are enrolling i mean uh, if you are enrolling colorectal cancer patients uh, versus a breast cancer population, um, is it completely different types of uh, PROs and questionnaires and quality of life, or is it just the same that you can really incorporate across the board? Um, well, the second part of that question I'm going to leave for Mike because he's much more expert than me in this. In fact, most of what I know about quality of life, I've, I've learned from him. But let, let me tackle your first comment there, which is, you know, we should measure it because the treatment might actually help quality of life. But uh, the other issue is it might um, uh, 
I help us identify unintended consequences or the downsides of a therapy. And I mean, as you and I have talked about before, the vast majority of RCTs now in the palliative space don't measure overall survival. They measure progression-free survival. And as we've talked about before, in most circumstances, PFS is not a proven surrogate for overall survival. So there's quite a leap of faith that we've made as an oncology community that PFS is important. And we can leave that conversation. We've had that before, but let's just put that out there. There's a lot of uncertainty about is PFS beneficial in that context. Um, given that uncertainty, we're putting people on treatments. And what is certain is that these treatments have side effects. They have clinical side effects, financial toxicity, and time toxicity. And so I think it's actually completely irresponsible of any trial team in that context not to measure quality of life because we're looking for something that may or may not matter to patients yet we're exposing them to toxic therapy so i think it's really crucial to measure quality of life there and i guess kind of circling back to the second part of your question i'll hand this over to mike you know i would con conceptualize you know the, the question you raised there's really three parts to it number one is what is the instrument you use number two is how do you use that instrument in the context of a trial how do you measure that endpoint. And then number three, which I think is really important is how do you analyze it and report it? And so maybe I'll hand over to Mike to kind of tackle each of those because that's where the average clinician I think falls apart. Maybe the trial team has trouble in designing it, but more importantly, the typical clinician reading the paper um, runs into trouble because we can't identify what's an appropriate measurement, uh, what's a quality of life benefit, detriment, et cetera. So Mike, why don't you enlighten us? And, and Mike, as you answer this, one issue that is really important in my mind is when you measure when when you measure these because i mean look to get chemotherapy and not to experience fatigue is just not logical to give radiotherapy and not to have some skin burn it's just impossible so there are certain things that are really expected they are just going to happen i know some chemotherapy is going to cause alopecia so I think the question would be, what, what, what you need to allude to is, is this patient who is undergoing radiation therapy and gets skin burn going to be bothered enough by that skin burn that might decline the radiotherapy because their quality of life is so bad because that's what they experienced and they might forego a treatment that could be curative or could be really palliative. I mean, that, that's where I struggle with this. Um, so help me under help me help me wrap my head around it. Yeah, so you've hit on some of the key things that uh, are problematic within within the universe of measuring quality of life on clinical trials. Let's go back to the original question just briefly. So, no, you can't use the same instrument for all circumstances. Why would you do that? The radi the radiation patient where you're interested in quantifying the adverse effects of skin reactions is very different than the chemotherapy patient where you're trying to think about fatigue and how much that's the problem for that patient. You need the right scale for the radiotherapy patient and the right instrument for the chemotherapy patient. There's no one instrument that's going to cover all those things that is pragmatic for use. The, um, the, 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 the fact that that's true uh, has resulted in hundreds and hundreds of PRO scales out there and in, in available for use. And that's where it gets confusing. Not only are there a bunch of different scales that you can choose from, but they have different strategies for scaling. They have different metrics. Sometimes a high score is good. Sometimes a high score is bad. Sometimes they're scored zero to a hundred. Sometimes they're scored zero to 157. It's, um, it's, it's really a heterogeneous field because of, you know, years of people developing different scales for different purposes, not using the same template or recipe when they're doing it. And that's why, as I said before, there's now more sophisticated ways of trying to standardize that and do it in a more um, homogeneous way from trial to trial. Um, but it gets back to my point that this is a science and you need a hypothesis. I've, I've seen trials that are interested in measuring side effects of radiotherapy, for example, where they were interested in measuring, say, short-term aspects of radiotherapy, but didn't actually measure quality of life until six weeks after treatment was done. They, 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 most of these instruments use a, use a look-back period of, say, a week. So they ask the question, how have you been in the last week? 
And so by then the patient felt fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. My week has been good. But yeah, if you asked me about four weeks ago, I was on the on the on the toilet several times a day. Thank you very much. That was no fun. But they missed that because they didn't analyze the the they didn't ask the patient to give them the information at the right point in time. So it has to get back to the hypothesis. So when we design clinical trials now, we're very careful about sitting down with the clinician leaders on those trials, the, the study PIs, and, and the people who understand the, 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 the context in which this trial is being conducted. And we say, okay, what, where, where's the action? What are you looking for? What do you anticipate? When do you anticipate it? And then we'll pick an instrument that is very good at getting what they want to get at and and use the right time of um, measurement to correspond with when they expect the, the events are going to happen. So it's about it's about thinking through what your hypothesis is and then testing that hypothesis with the right instrument. We, um, as part of our work, uh, we have a consortium, by the way, that I might mention towards the end. That, that this consortium is international and it's basically a what Americans would call dissemination and implementation, what Canadians would call knowledge translation. But it's trying to disseminate tools to measure PROs properly and effectively in clinical trials. And as part of that consortium, we analyzed um, several different um, guidelines that are out there, guidance documents about how to choose the right instrument. So back to which instrument for which trial. Uh, one was from the FDA, one was from a, a, a group called Isaqual, an academic group. There are several others. And it turns out they basically all said the same thing. There was very little substantive difference between these guidance documents. And so we pulled those into kind of a, an overall, overall document um, that looks at um, how to choose the right instrument for the right trial, for the right patients at the right time. And all that information is free, public domain. I can give you the the link uh, a bit later on. But uh, for any of your listeners that actually want to educate themselves about how to do this properly in a lot more detail, uh, our website, consortium website, has everything you would want to know about measuring PROs and clinical trials from a from a pragmatic operational standpoint. Chris, how, how do these, how do uh, patients do this on the trials? Is it, um, take me through the logistics. Is it they come in, you give them a paper that they fill, uh, iPad, uh, the nurse asks them the questionnaire that's already predetermined. Like how, how does this actually occur in the clinic? So I, mean, I think that's evolving over time. Historically, it was a heck of a lot of paper. I mean, I can speak mostly from the experience of the trial where I'm the PI, which is the, uh, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group CO21, which is an international R phase three RCT of um, physical activity as an adjuvant strategy for patients with stage three colon cancer. So these are patients who have um, undergone surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy for stage three colon cancer. Um, they're about to initiate a surveillance protocol and they're randomized to a three-year structured program of physical activity, essentially an exercise intervention for three years compared to a control arm, which is allowed to exercise on their own, but they don't get a funded personal trainer for three years. So this is a trial of a thousand patients. Primary endpoint is disease-free survival. Um, and it's been open for a de over a decade now. Um, we're almost finished accrual. It's, uh, we're, we're just approaching 900 patients. Um, so the primary endpoint of that trial is disease-free survival. It's a very ambitious target. Uh, but, you know, the important part about doing the trial was also to show that, you know, we kind of take it for granted now that these lifestyle interventions are of interest to the oncology community. But when I wrote this protocol as a research fellow, kind of in 2006, 7, 8, uh, this was way, way out there. Like no one, everyone thought we were crazy. And it was only a group of senior people, including Michael and others at the CCTG, who, after me repeatedly pitching this and the patient groups got really engaged, said, yeah, we're going to do this. And so they committed to doing, you know, the first RCT in the world of an exercise intervention um, at the phase three level powered for disease free survival. But in any case, uh, you know, D DFS is the primary endpoint. But even if we were unable to meet that, uh, we hypothesized there would be a myriad of improvements and benefits for patients when it comes to their quality of life, physical function, anxiety, depression. So there's a whole host of PROs. In fact, it's quite a lengthy panel. And so this is um, when patients come in every six months on their trial visits, uh, they go on the treadmill with the physical activity consultant, they have their imaging, and they also complete a whole package of, uh, you know, paperwork.
Um, this is transitioning now to electronic capture. I think Michael can tell us how that varies across different trials and centers and sites, but it's often a seven day or 30 day look back where patients are asked to report on various PROs, including their physical activity, their overall wellness, their physical function, and their quality of life. So I think it can vary, but the uh, the frequency with which you measure it and the look back window are obviously very important. So, but Michael, I mean, this is, um, to me, it sounds like, you know, of course, if you give a structured exercise, the patient's going to have, they will have better quality of life. I mean, if you give me a trainer and you tell me to exercise and you push me, I probably will feel better. I mean, is this is the null hypothesis that this will not be better? Correct. The null hypothesis is it will not improve your well-being. And the alternative hypothesis will, that it will. That could be fatigue. That could be emotional well-being. That could be... Uh, energy levels in in other ways, um, sexual functioning, whatever. Who knows? Who knows how an exercise program might benefit the patient unless you systematically ask hundreds of patients who get the intervention versus not. Um, the uh, the more exciting hypothesis is: Will it allow people to live longer? Will it, will it delay the cancer from recurring or prevent it from recurring at all. And that's that's what makes this trial exciting because you're right. Most of us assume the uh, the energy endpoint would be shown and would be only moderately exciting, but a survival endpoint would be very exciting. So one of the concerns though, and, and I presume you'll agree with me that uh, on a clinical trial, like the one just Chris mentioned, the exercise one as an example, um, mm -hmm. You know, you have the funding, you have the support, you have the trainer, however it is that you actually have it where when the patient comes in, they're undergoing an intervention and you're measuring that impact on this intervention on, on the quality of life. But mm -hmm. once it's real world, I mean, where 80 to 90% of patients get treated outside of clinical trials, how practical is it that physicians in practice are going to indeed measure patient report outcomes, quality of life, you know. Um... So, so that that gets that gets back to a question you asked earlier, which I didn't really address, Chatty, and that is um, the patient with the radiotherapy side effects. Say, say skin burn, say diarrhea, it doesn't matter. How is that patient going to benefit from quality of life, and can they decline the treatment? Um, we, we kind of think about this in a different way. We think about the reason we're measuring quality of life in clinical trials is not for the patients on the trial. It's to generate the results of the trial to inform future decisions for future patients. So what, what do we need to tell clinicians? What do we need to tell them about what happened in this trial in terms of how the intervention impacted quality of life? So they can go to their next patient and say, you know, this trial of exercise actually made people feel better and it kept their cancer way longer. We, if, if you're up for it, we need to try to get you on some sort of systematic exercise intervention. It doesn't have to, you know, you, you want to try to replicate the trial intervention as close as you can, but that's not really going to be pragmatic. But the, the principle that exercise improves quality of life and delays cancer recurrence, you can operationalize that between the future patients and future clinicians. Same with radiotherapy. The, the patients who undergo the radiotherapy on a clinical trial, their decisions have been made. But I can take that information and tell my next patient, you know, we did this study and it turns out that patients had a little bit of diarrhea, but it didn't bother them very much. And so um, I, I, I think you're going to tolerate it just fine. You know, um, those, those sorts of things. And the whole idea of measuring quality of life in clinical trials is to inform future decision-making as far as I'm concerned. You know, but, Chad, just to follow up on one of your earlier points, about, especially with the exercise trial, I got this a lot when I was writing the protocol, like, you know, friends and colleagues would say, you know, of course, exercise is going to make people feel better. We know it's good for everyone. Why do you need to do this on an RCT? And I am in that camp, by the way. I am in yeah. that camp. 
So, so, and I mean, I agree that as, you know, a lifelong, you know, long distance runner and enthusiast for exercise, but, but if we take a step back, so this was inspired by some, you know, largely observational data from um, the U S uh, Jeff Meyerhart and colorectal cancer and Michelle Holmes and breast cancer that reported a very impressive improvement in disease free and relapse free survival uh, with post uh, therapy exercise. Again, it was typically observational or kind of post talk analysis and so we thought, you know, it'd be worth testing this in a rigorous fashion. Um, and even if we don't meet the disease-free survival endpoint, it's likely people are going to feel better. So then friends would say, well, why bother doing it? Everyone should exercise, but people don't. People don't. And one of the reasons is they don't is because they're not supported in the same way as they are with getting radiotherapy or chemotherapy or surgery. So one of the reasons to do this, well, the, f the first reason was to see, can we improve DFS? The second reason was to show the oncology community that these lifestyle intervention trials are feasible. They can be done. They're important and they matter to patients. But the third issue is if we showed improved quality of life, you could then go to your payer, to the Ministry of Health, and you could say, look, this has a substantial benefit for patients in a context of a, a life-threatening illness, and we should fund this. We should support this. And part of the cancer center package of care, after you see the surgeon and the chemotherapy nurse and the pharmacist and the med onc, and you finished your chemotherapy, there should be a funded personal trainer as part of your, your journey. And that will sustain these exercise changes over time. So that was from a policy point of view, one reason that we thought it important to do the trial. Um, but one thing that we struggle with in designing all of these, and, and I still struggle with it, um, and maybe Mike can comment, is how does a clinician interpret these complicated analysis when they read a report? And specifically, when do we use you know, a mean change score or when do we dichotomize and say what proportion of patients had an improvement of X or a deterioration of Y? And I think this is where clinicians often get hung up reading the papers because we never understand this stuff. And I think sometimes it's done well and sometimes it's not done very well. And the yeah. average clinician can't distinguish that. Mike, can you can you enlighten <laughs> Chad and I? Well, that, that was a that was a turn to the left, but yeah, sure. Um so I, I, first before I answer that, I I'll echo your thoughts about policy, of course, is the other reason we do these these studies to inform um, decisions about funding the intervention and what the impact is on beyond disease outcomes. So thank you for it. Um including that, Chris. So, you know, I mean, I've been trying to educate clinicians about how to interpret quality of life data long enough that I've, 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 I've decided we need a different strategy. Um, he's given so, up on me, Chatty. He's given yeah. up. <laughs> well, I think, I, mean, I think he's talking about me. He's not giving up on you. No, like I, let, I'm, let, I'm, I'm still let, struggling with the idea that we need a trial to show exercise actually helps. I, yeah, like we'll I, I don't think I don't I don't think exercise hurts. But anyway, let's move on from that one. <laughs> so let's let's draw the analogy with with survival. Um, so, or let's say conventional clinical trials outcomes. You can show a clinician say a survival curve and show that. Um, uh, you know, the hazard ratio is 0.73 or something, comparing two different survival curves. That's common lingo right now. And lots of clinicians have a sense now that a hazard ratio of 0.7 is is meaningful. It's, it's, it's substantially lower than one. But what they really do is they look visually at the two curves and see how far apart they are and use Cliff Lofter's rule of thumb, which is, can I get my thumb between the two the two curves, survival curves, and if it's the, the separation is big enough to get your thumb between the curves, and that's that's clinically meaningful. That clinicians use heuristic metrics like that to simplify how they do things. They can also look at, say, median survival, um, you know, six months versus four months, or they could look at how many patients are alive at 10 years, 20% versus 30%. Clinicians have different ways of thinking about survival statistics, and, and they're naturally able to think of survival in those different ways, um, comparing to hazard ratios, comparing median survival, comparing long-term survival. Most clinicians don't understand anything about the statistics behind that. They don't know what a hazard is, let alone a hazard ratio. They don't know how a kaplan plier modest plot is created. But they've seen them enough, often enough, and in the same way that they have an intrinsic gestalt about 
you know, what a survival curve means to them when they're looking at a clinical trial result. But we don't have that in the quality of life industry. We, we, we publish different instruments all the time, different metrics all the time, sometimes average scores, sometimes change scores. It's, it's not that complicated. You, you can show average quality of life over time and it can go up from 70 to 80 in one group and go from 70 down to 60 in the other group. And that's meaningful, but clinicians don't know what 70 means in the first place or 60 or 80. They don't have an intrinsic sense of it like they do for, you know, median survival, even though they have no idea how most of them don't have an idea how a median survival is calculated. So it's, um, it's we've done it to ourselves by creating all this heterogeneity that clinicians just get lost in the, in the, in the, in the noise. So, I think the onus is on the writers of the publications, the authors of the clinical trials to completely make clear how to interpret the quality of life data from the trial and how to integrate that into the interpretation of the trial. What, what have we learned from these quality of life data? So sometimes we report response rates, like Chris said, sometimes we say, you know, 30% of patients had an, had an improvement in fatigue in one arm whereas only 10% had an improvement in fatigue in the other arm, getting back to Chris's trial. That's meaningful. Okay, I get 30 versus 10. I can get my head around that. Uh, but if you plot fatigue rates over time, you might get a different picture. There's no single right way of doing it. There's a consortium called the CISAQUAL Consortium, which stands for uh, Setting International Standards for Measuring Quality of Life. That's led by statisticians. They have a laudable goal. They're trying to standardize statistical approach to um, quality of life measurement in clinical trials, and they're making great progress. So hopefully we'll reduce some of the heterogeneity by, by um, having um, more common standards for how we do things. But there's always gonna be a lack of understanding fundamentally of what these scales scores mean and the only way to get around that is to translate it for them just say here's what the quality of life data are telling us about the impact of these two treatments on patient well-being so i have, so, several, I have several questions though uh yeah like um you you mentioned uh, before you talk about interpreting and so on you you said yeah. that these tools need to be validated correct how do you validate them? <laughs> so that's that's a great question. Um, there's different types of validation. There's called what's uh, what's called an external anchor. So you could criterion validation. We won't get too techy, but that's that's showing that whatever happens to your quality of life scores makes sense in terms of what else is happening to the patient. So as clinicians, we measure ECOG performance status all the time or Karnofsky performance status all the time. You, you would hypothesize that if the quality of life on physical functioning went down, the Karnofsky score also should go down or the ECOG score should go up. It, it wouldn't make sense if that weren't the case. So you compare your what your instrument is telling you to some other standard of of measurement that you have some reasonable faith in. Um, the other thing you can do is show it's sensitive to change. So if you make somebody sick by um, evidence by say toxicity rates, those some of that should be reflected um, in the quality of life data. In fact, historically, the quality of life data are much more sensitive in picking those things up. So clinicians underestimate levels of say fatigue or um, um, other symptoms, whereas the quality of life data show a much bigger effect. So um, that those are pretty much the way that we do it. There's other ways, but um, the, the the idea of validation is that the the instrument should should measure what it's intended to measure, and therefore the the score should behave in the way that you expect them to behave. Chris, one of the things that um, I faced in practice with some patients is that Patients fear that you may make a change in the protocol or in the treatment uh, because they are afraid uh, that this change might affect how the cancer will respond. I vividly recall a patient of mine who was having pain uh, because he was telling me he was not having pain and his wife was shaking her head that he's lying to me because he was afraid that, uh, um, you know, I may change the treatment. And he was convinced that the treatment is working. So besides that, 
<clears throat> how do, do you feel that when the, the patient's response to some of these measures might be confounded by their perception of how you may actually um, intervene based on the on the on on their answers. Yeah, certainly in routine practice, I I think that is an issue. I mean, you see that every day. If we have to dose reduce because of you know fatigue or diarrhea or neutropenia, the pay, you can always see the look in their eyes. Usually, they will ask, "Is this going to alter the outcome? Do I need more cycles? Will extend therapy?" And even if they don't ask that, I usually try to reassure them or I, I talk about that because I know it's something they worry about. Um, and so I, I guess that probably is a barrier for the patients. And it also probably comes back to the clinician helping the patient balance the potential risks and benefits on both sides. So for example, um, uh, for many years, I only treat GI cancer now, but for many years I treated uh, GU cancer and GI cancer, so testicular cancer. And I treated many young men with a lot of extreme toxicity with BEP, but given what was at stake and the tremendous benefits of therapy in that context, the patients and I were generally willing to put up with quite a bit of toxicity to get through um, treatment for metastatic testicular cancer when they could still be cured with um, delivery of, uh, you know, dose intense BEP kind of on, on, on protocol. Um, and let, let's go to my other practice in GI cancer, where I'm treating someone with metastatic pancreas cancer, where the potential benefits of therapy from a survival point of view are, are just an order of magnitude less. And so in that context, I'm, I am very sensitive as a clinician to adjusting therapy based on quality of life and side effects, because the potential downsides of me reducing fulfirinox dosing by 25% is very different from me dropping the cisplatin dose in BEP. So I think that's where we can work with the patient and understand, you know, their own values and preferences, but also the big picture, which is, you know, what is the magnitude of benefit from a survival point of view of the therapy that we're offering? One of the things, Chris, that we see often uh, in clinical trial reporting, you're you're sitting, uh, you know, listening to an oral presentation at ASCO, and oftentimes <clears throat> there's the table of adverse events, and it, and then you get the conclusion slide, and oftentimes the conclusion slide says um, adverse events were well tolerated. Uh, twenty percent grade uh, two neuropathy and five percent grade three whatever. Uh, patients tolerate therapy well. Um, I think we can we 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 all know that oftentimes this trial doesn't even have a tool to even look at, at this. Uh, did not have actual uh, tool to measure that, but you see that day in and day out. That's why I asked you in the beginning, why do you do this in all clinical trials? And your answer was obviously unequivocally yes, but I don't see that. And I see the reporting oftentimes confounded by the fact that the physician wants to say that the treatment was well tolerated. How skeptical are you when you see that? And, and, and what's, the, what's the solution? Yeah, I think very. And I think it gets back to a comment Mike made earlier. I think clinicians, I think we underestimate the toxicity and quality of life and symptom burden of our patients. And on the converse, I think patients, Mike probably has empiric data, though. he can correct me uh, or tell me if I'm right or wrong. I think patients often may overestimate the potential upsides and benefits of our therapy. So we're, we're in a catch 22 there. We underestimate the harms. Patients are overestimating the benefits. I think this probably drives a lot of care um, that at the end of the day may or may not be in keeping with the patient's best interests or their own values and preferences. So I think it is a problem. I mean, you know, acceptable to all these phrases that people, including our, our good friend, Bichelle, have written about who determines what toxicity is acceptable or no new safety signals have emerged, but five people died. I mean, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of language that is used. Um, and so the other problem is that often the quality of life analysis is not part of the primary uh, reporting at the major plenary session or in the initial report. So it gets left over and people maybe gloss over it because it's hard to read. It's hard to understand. Um, we're probably not trained properly in residency and fellowship to dissect it and appraise it very well. That's probably something that the educators can take on. And as Mike and his colleagues have realized, the research community and Mike and his colleagues are trying to mobilize the community to report in a more, um, you know, a clear, clear way for clinicians to understand. Um, you know, along those lines, you know, there's often these 
I don't know if they're intentional games played, but the way that quality of life can be presented, it can almost be spun, right? You know, are you talking about the proportion of patients who have a deterioration and, oh, you know, this treatment was good because fewer patients had a deterioration. So are we, are we okay with that? Or are we actually trying to make people feel better? And should we be reframing it the other way, the number of patients who actually had an improvement of quality of life? And so those are, you know, some tricky things. And, and, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to understand what a trial is showing, I, you know, I'll take it to Mike and he'll just be able to dissect it immediately and say, well, they probably should have analyzed it this way or that way, because there can be biases that, you know, might make this sound less toxic or less problematic than it really is. <laughs> So, so can I chime in on that maybe a little bit? So <clears throat> two, two pieces to my response. One, addressing Chris's points. So, um, yeah, the, the whole idea of emphasizing this as a science and standardizing how we do things is meant to get around A, bias reporting, and B, spin, right? If if there's a standard way of doing it, you can't spin it. You got to do it right. Um, and that's that's the goal of, of standardization and, and scientific quality. To your point... Looking at the ASCA presentation where there's, you know, 10% of patients got grade two toxicity, uh, we have a solution for that happily. Um, and it's led by Ethan Bash, who we mentioned before we, we started, medical oncology oncologue uh, in the US. And he's got an interest in, instead of, instead of the nurses and the doctors measuring common toxicity criteria, the patient should be reporting their own common toxicity criteria. So this this is a type of PRO that's very much a PRO, the patients report it, but we don't consider it really a quality of life outcome per se, because it's not a domain, it's not functioning. It's basically one symptom at a time, exactly the same as the common toxicity criteria works. And each each of these things has um, has three dimensions to it. So what was the what was the example you gave, Chad? It was some um, grade two something neurotoxicity. So so uh, if you ask the patient to report on their neuro neurotoxicity, they basically answer three questions. How much, how frequent, how frequently do you have this symptom? What's the severity of the symptom? And most importantly, how much does it bother you? And so you get three different remarks or three different perspectives on neurotoxicity from the patient that are unequivocal. You can tease out frequency from severity and you can tease out bother from severity. And if you do that systematically, you win. And so Ethan has spent a long time working with the NCI US to develop this system for, for measuring toxicity from the patient's perspective. And it's now formally called the PRO CTCAE. So it's a common toxicity criteria in a PRO format. And then if, if you collect those data properly, analyze it properly, then you can re reliably say how well the data, uh, how well the treatment was tolerated. Because you have the patient's views on tolerability, not not the um, loosey-goosey um, in-field um, measurements. So, so the last uh, the last uh, part that I would like to discuss, and then I'll I'll let you go. I know it's getting late. Uh, um, is maybe some of this is my own bias, so you have to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I I I kind of feel for curative disease, it's very difficult to um uh, to to really do that adequately in a way that's going to really forego a curative therapy. I mean, obviously. Chris brought in testicular cancer, which is the extreme because you could cure 90% of these patients or more. But, uh, you know, there are other, many other situations where you know you can cure, whether it's radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And at least from a uh, hematology and oncology standpoint, uh, our extreme is usually transplant, uh, you know, allogeneic transplant and, and autologous transplant in certain situation. And you know, uh, in acute myeloid leukemia or some of the uh, diseases, uh, when you do allogeneic transplant, I mean, um, you know, patients go to hell and then come back uh, in hopefully certain situation. And and I don't know how you measure that, honestly. It's, it's like, I know how miserable they're going to be um, with the treatment that we're going to give. And um, so help me understand how you... You know, how do you balance this in a curative situation? Um, in Hodgkin, when you give ABVD or AAVD, you know they're going to have a lot of issues, but you hope that you cure them and with time things resolve. 
So let's discuss maybe PROs and quality of life in a curative setting, and that will be the last part of the conversation. So when you say, how do you resolve this? Can you help me understand what the trade-off well, is that you're talking about? Yeah, for example, do you think that when you do quality of life measurements and PRO in a curative setting, and you know they mm. will be detrimental uh, in the short term, I mean, you kind of know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel that some patients based on these scales might forego a curative therapy because your their quality of life might be going lower for the first six months of treatment? Is, is this, do you think that's a possibility? So that question has been tested um, formally with empirical data. It's I, the usual, the usual scenario is the adjuvant setting, uh, or at least the most common thing in clinical trials. So if somebody has a certain chance of cure after say their tumor is removed and f additional treatment can improve those chances of cure, uh, what's the cost? What, what's the quality of life cost? Um, or there's no alternative. If, if as you say, if, if your only hope is an autologous transplant, what what's the cost in terms of quality of life of that um, of that intervention? I I I don't I so back to my point previously. If patients have a choice between treatment A and treatment B, where treatment A is more intense and a little bit more effective. And treatment B is much less intense, but a bit less effective in terms of cure rates. How do you help a patient make that decision between, you know, aggressive treatment versus more um, tolerable treatment? And that's a trade-off between the side effects of treatment and the added gains. That's a fairly common scenario. But in your intense adjuvant treatment or in your curative kind of intense treatment, I think it comes down to not trade-off decision-making, but informing future patients who are facing that situation. And you can tell them a little bit how sick they're going to get, but more importantly, you can tell them how well they're going to recover. And you can show them data to say, you know, six months later, you know, functioning is almost as good in the people that went through all this as people who didn't have to go through it, you know, compared to say the standard population. So you can, you can inform patients what their future you know, prospects are in terms of getting through this and where they will end up on the other side of the experience. So that makes them feel that um, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, and, th and they can look forward to some recovery based on the clinical data that, that we do have. So it can be useful, even if it's bloody obvious that they're going to get really sick and have a really tough time during the actual treatment. It's a no-brainer that their quality of will suffer during the treatment. It's very, very helpful. Um, Chris, any questions I need to ask? I mean, th this is, I I've learned so much. Uh, any questions you think um, we need to cover or any things I've missed that uh, is of relevance or importance? No, I think, um, I mean, this is a really deep topic and, you know, it might be worth having another conversation sometime because Mike's done some very innovative work, you know, with patient decision making and understanding patient preferences, which is kind of a spinoff from this. But I think um, this is a topic I, I think I think it's good. You know, it's wonderful that you're broaching this subject on your podcast. I know you told me it was actually hard to find someone because there's not a lot of people who uh, can speak the clinical language and speak the quality of life PRO language in a way that, you know, simple clinicians like you and I can grasp. So uh, I think education for our community and probably starting in training is really important. You know, we're taught from a critical appraisal point of view, how to dissect a trial, but in medical school and residency, at least in my own training, we kind of gloss over the quality of life, probably because our teachers didn't really understand how to do it very well either. And hopefully that will change over time, because I think it's something that we we owe our patients to do a better job measuring, uh, reporting, and then informing them at the bedside. Mike, uh, anything I should have uh, covered or missed that uh, is of importance? Well, no, you've asked very insightful questions. And of course, the answers to each of the questions you've posed can get very complicated very quickly. So we're trying to stay like at 30,000 feet here. But for people who do want to learn more, I mentioned that consortium. It's called the Proteus Consortium. Uh, Proteus being a bacterium familiar to some uh, uh, physicians, but in this case, it stands for PROs, engaging users and stakeholders. And it, it is a bunch of tools that, and, and uh, other resources that will help people that have an interest in measuring PROs and clinical trials. So the website is theproteusconsortium.org uh, and it's public domain, free of any, um, any, um, uh, commercial influence.
I think I think the biggest mm. the, the biggest return on investment would be to find ways where um, physicians in community practice or in real world practice are able to measure these um, in, in a fast way and an effective way. I mean, you know, many oncologists in, in the community, they see 20 to 30 patients a day. And I think it's similar, it reminds me uh, of geriatric assessment, right? <laughs> It's one of those, we, we know how important geriatric assessment is, um, and it's published, it's written that it improves survival, actually, sometimes when you when you do it, and yet you don't see it happening. And the only reason for that, in my opinion, is logistically, it's so challenging for busy clinicians to actually do it. Uh, and I recall uh, I had a trial looking at comprehensive geriatric assessment as part of, uh, of the study that I was running, and I would have like, you know, several folks coming, helping, doing the assessment. It, it, was, it wasn't really easy. And I think this is similar. You, you've opened a, a, a whole new freeway down the road to measuring PROs in clinical practice as opposed to clinical trials, which we've been talking about. Equally complex, equally important to do right. Uh, but it has its own set of, um, of issues. And um, as you say, it, we know what to do with more problematic to do it yeah so chris hopefully uh we'll be able to translate what you're doing in clinical trials to practice because ultimately this is really important but uh i can't thank you enough this was actually educational for me <laughs> i hope my listeners are going to learn as much as i did oh i'm sure they will and shadi your listeners uh you know as, as we wrap up this session at the intersection of quality of life a little bit of trivia for your listeners of healthcare and filtered but one of your other Frequent guests, um, Aaron Goodman, who uh, is a musician just like Michael Brundage uh, from a quality of life point of view. It's something that many of us enjoy. But I'll just give, you know, your your listeners and viewers a shot. So this is the studio. When Goodman comes to Canada, this is where uh, Booth and Goodman jam. And so oh. this is the piano and the guitar studio where, you know, we've heard everything from uh, Bohemian Rhapsody to Neil Young to Guns N' Roses. Yeah, to a picture of so there we go. Uh, yeah, a, a bit of a bit of rock and roll trivia there in an old farmhouse in Kingston, Ontario. And and Jeff and Jeff Beck died today. How sad is that? One of my guitar hero icons. Oh my goodness, it's a new era. This is this life is, goes on. This was excellent. Well, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for spending some time with me.